I'm Dr. Yi Doki from Assam Medical Center, and I will talk about the basics of neurovascular intervention, focusing on neurointerventional devices. Neurovascular intervention is an interventional radiology. Sometimes it is called as endovascular neurosurgery. I think politically correct term for this is neurointervention, which means non-surgical, minimally invasive treatment for neurovascular disease under imaging guidance. This is typical fluoroscopic imaging, which we are using for the various interventional procedures under X-ray fluoroscopy. As gastroenterologists use endoscopy or surgeons use laparoscopy for their procedure, we are using various real-time imaging tools especially X-ray fluoroscopy for neurovascular intervention. Under imaging guidance, various percutaneous approach can be done. For the endovascular approach, the most preferred route is common femoral artery. Sometimes we use a radial artery as an alternative, but any accessible vessel can be chose for the vascular access. These are the targets of neurointerventional procedures. The lesions of interest for neurointervention are ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, such as cerebral ischemia, cerebral aneurysms and brain and spinal cord AVM or dural atrovenous fistulas. Rarely, we also perform various procedures for head and neck vascular malformation and tumors, head and neck bleeding, etc. I think neural interventionists are the plumbers for the brain vessels. Why? We try to stop or prevent any leakages. For example, cerebral aneurysm embolization and brain AVM and drug AVF embolization. Sometimes we open clogged pipes. For example, balloon angioplasty or stenting for the carotid artery or intracranial stenosis. Recently, more and more thrombectomy procedures are popular for acute ischemic revascularization treatment. As we have previously reviewed under the title of the basics of cerebral angiography, preparation of neurovascular intervention requires basically the same devices and equipment. On top of that, we need interventional devices such as embolic materials, balloon casters, stents, thrombectomy devices, and other specialized devices. On top of basic angiography casters, for the endovascular treatment, we need various diagnostic and therapeutic casters, guiding casters, microcasters, and balloon angioplast casters, etc. First of all, different from the simple angiography, we need a guiding caster for the certain procedure because sturdy guiding caster is the most fundamental part of a successful neurovascular procedure which guides the operator from the puncture access site to the target lesion within the supra aortic and the intracranial arterial lesions. A typical guiding caster looks like this. It has larger bore, which means ID for the introduction of various devices within the lumen. Because of the tortuosity of neurovascular system, the guiding caster should have flexible distal part so that it facilitates good shape adjustment. We need various guiding casters for various purposes. This is a typical location of the guiding caster within the petrous segment of the internal carotid artery for the access of intracranial lesion. For that purpose, we choose flexible distal segment guiding casters. For study support, sometimes we use large bore stiff guiding caster like this. The outer diameter of a typical guiding caster ranges from 5 French to 9 French. Sometimes balloon guide caster has a balloon at the tip of the caster for the flow control during the procedure. Guiding casters are selected according to the type of the procedure, device compatibility. As you can see here, sometimes we put not only one device within the guiding caster, sometimes two or sometimes three. The second thing is microcasters and microguide wires. Microcasters for the neurovascular systems are not that different from regular microcasters, except for the length. 
total length is longer because brain vessels are far distal than other uh, body target organ and flexible distal segment because of the need of adaptation to the tortuosity of the intracranial arteries. And sometimes it, the tip is shapeable and sometimes it has pre-shaped tips. This is a typical way of aneurysm selection using a microcaster and the wire. These are pre-shaped microcasters at the tip. Sometimes we steam shape the microcaster like this. From now on, I would like to introduce some typical neurointerventional procedures together with the individual devices. In 2017, Assam Medical Center neurointervention team performed about 1,000 procedures. Among them, almost half of the procedure were endovascular treatment of both ruptured and unruptured aneurysms. And about 10% of the procedures were for acute revascularization therapy for the acute stroke. Another 10% for the various angioplasty and the stenting procedures. Another 10% for brain ABM and dual AVF embolization, and followed by tumor and trauma related embolization, venous intervention, and spinal procedures, etc. It means the majority of our procedure is related to the aneurysm treatment and ischemic stroke. Cerebral aneurysms. A 69 year old lady with an unruptured ACOM origin aneurysm. As you can see with this CT angiographic image, you can see the aneurysm here. This is the TFCA finding. And then we obtained the 3D angiographic image. We could identify wide neck, irregular shaped, medium sized aneurysm at the bifurcation of the left side ICA. This is the fusion 3D image of right ICA and left ICA. And you can clearly see the relationship between these two ACAs. There are two treatment options in this situation. One is microsurgical clipping. As you can see here, this is surgical technique. And another method is endovascular treatment using coil embolization. When we decide the treatment options, we balance the procedure safety and long-term efficacy. Sometimes we combine the treatment. We decide to perform the endovascular embolization we found the good working projection, which we can identify the neck and the branching vessel status like this. We put stents first for one ACA first, and then the other ACA next. After that, we put coils one by one until we completely pack the aneurysm sac like this. This is a typical stent assisted coil embolization procedure. During the procedure, we use microcoil. It has various shape, it has detachment joint. So after successful placement of the total length of the coil, we can detach the coil. So the mechanisms are electrolytic, hydraulic, or thermal, something like that. As you can see in that particular case, stents are successfully used for the prevention of coil loop herniation during the embolization into the parent artery. It has self-expanding mesh like this. Recently, more and more innovative devices are introducing instead of the stand. A totally new approach to aneurysm repair is getting popular, which called flow divergent therapy. This flow diverter looks like a very fine poured stand-like device. When we put the, this device at the neck segment of the parent artery, as you can see here, because of the very fine pore, the intraaneurysmal flow slowly decreases with time, promoting thrombosis of the aneurysmal sac, and the deleterization of this mesh will completely occlude the aneurysm. This is a totally new approach to the large aneurysms. I think this technique will change the treatment paradigm of the uh, cerebral aneurysms. In the future. How about brain AVM and the dual AVF? 21 year old female, sudden onset severe headache. She also showed severe nausea and vomiting, followed by seizure. The CT was like this ICH and IVH, diffuse brain edema, CT angiography show the vascular mass here. This is a 3D CT angiography demonstration. Medium-sized elongated shape of the vascular mass with the draining vein and uh, the feeder is mostly the ipsilateral ACA. Brain AVM by definition is abnormal vascular mass with a feeding artery and draining vein. 
the ABM can be treated with the medical management, surgical excision, endovascular embolization, and gamma knife radiosurgery. And most of the time, multidisciplinary approach, including all these treatment options, are considered according to the lesion characteristics. These are the role of embolization for brain ABM treatment. We can do curative embolization by complete nidal obliteration with the emboling material or target embolization. Or sometimes we perform volume reduction as adjunctive treatment of both surgery and gamma knife. Sometimes we do palliative embolization rarely. So we perform the angiography. The ABM nidus was seen like this. We put the guided caster up to the cavernous ICA and put another intermediate caster into MCA. Within that intermediate caster, we navigate the microcaster through the feeding artery like this. Microcaster is further navigated deep into the ABM nidus. And then the liquid emboling material was injected very slowly, you can see the opacification of the nidus with this embolic material. And we continue injection over and over until we occlude the whole nidus. This is the final embolization result showing complete disappearance of the nidus, as you can see here. As embolic material, we can use and butyl cyanacrylate, which we call glue, or sometimes we use non-adhesive, cohesive liquid emboling materials such as onyx or fill. How about acute ischemic stroke? 80 year old gentleman presented with a sudden left side weakness. And these are the time profile of this patient. He presented about two and a half hours after his symptom onset. And then he had uh, some risk factors and his stroke score was 10. We performed the MR image showing infarction here and some penumbra here. MR angiography showed occlusion of the ICA and then tandem MCA occlusion here. Not only the ICA, but also MCA occlusions are problematic. We decided to recognize these lesions. Here you can see occlusion of the ipsilateral ICA from the bulb. We went in, found complete occlusion of right MCA here by filling the fact caused by thrombus. After navigation through the occluded MCA, we put stent river. Here you can see the integrated flow through the expanded stent. Still, you can see the filling effect here. The stent river looks like this. There are various kinds of uh, stent rivers, as you can see here. Now is the time to pull out the stent river, as you can see here. We pull out. The patient is moving due to a little bit of pain caused by the pulling force. This is the device capturing the clot. With this mechanical clot retrieval, sometimes we use stent river, sometimes we use aspiration casters. Both are very effective. How about atherosclerotic steno occlusive lesions, such as carotid artery stenosis or intracranial artery stenosis? For the primary and the secondary prevention of ischemic stroke in those situations, we use balloon angioplasty casters and the stents. These are typical angioplastic caster and the stand, which we call wingspan system, is approved for the intracranial stenosis. Uh, this is the schema of atherosclerotic intracranial stenosis. First, we put the balloon angioplastic caster and dilate it like this. And for the prevention of elastic recoil of the angioplasty segment, we put self-expanding stand like this. This is the final result of balloon angioplasty and the stenting for the intracranial stenosis. 58-year-old male presented with a right side weakness showed left ICA cortical border zone infarction with the flare signal change. And angiogram showed eccentric moderate stenosis here. So we put the patient on antiplate management. So we put the patient on anti-atherogenic medical management. The follow-up result was like this. After another one year follow-up, the patient presented with a TIA due to progression of the stenosis. High resolution ML imaging showed enhancing eccentric plaque here. So we decided to perform the procedure. 
First, we put the guide wire and the balloon angioplasty caster and then perform the angioplasty and the stenting. This is the final result of angioplasty with a stent placement. Another 77-year-old male presented with left side weakness with some diffusion high signal lesion showed severe right proximal ICA stenosis here. What are the treatment options for this situation? We can put the patient on the best medical management or we can do revascularization therapy, either by surgery and uh, endovascular treatment, which we call CEA or CAS. So we decide to perform carotid artery stenting. The major drawback of carotid artery stenting is intraprocedural embolism by manipulation of the red large plaque at the atherosclerotic stenotic site. Either with the angioplastic caster and the stent, we can provoke various embolism like this. For the prevention of this complication, we need to use anti-embolic devices, either distally or either proximally. We can choose according to the characteristic of the patient and the lesion. This is a, a typical distal anti-embolic device, which we call filter or umbrella. Another anti-embolic method is using balloon guiding caster, which we call flow arrest, proximal anti-embolic method. By placing this balloon-tipped guiding caster during the procedure, the flow of that segment can be arrested until we aspirate out the whole dirty debris generated during the procedure for the prevention of distal embolism. So we decided uh, to use the balloon guiding caster for that patient. This is the angiography, very severe stenosis of the proximal ICA, as you can see here. On the fluoroscopy, we put balloon like this, and then angioplasty and the stent placement. So we have reviewed various typical neurointerventional procedures and devices. Neurointervention, whether it is called as interventional neuroradiology or endovascular neurosurgery, it requires various endovascular devices for the treatment of various neurovascular diseases under fluoroscopic imaging guidance, embolizations with the coils, rigid emboling materials, or particulate emboling materials, or revascularization with the balloon angioplasty caster stents, or various mechanical thrombectomy devices. With the advent of technical and device innovations, more and more new treatment approaches are tried with intervention. Thank you.